This is, uh, me especially, this is a very interesting uh, talk tonight. Because right. That I don't know anything about at all. I wasn't even aware that there had been uh, mass emigration from the west of Ireland or controlled emigration. But anyway, tonight we welcome Jared Moran. And of course, you are all particularly welcome as well. And I believe that we may possibly have some visitors from as far afield as Minnesota. You're all very welcome tonight. Fear falls your old galeer. So Jared um, is going to speak to us. He is a retired academic, which I don't believe for a minute. I don't think that man would ever stop working. <laughs> and, um, he has lectured at NUI Galway and in Maynooth. And he is currently a researcher at the Social Science Research Centre in NUI. Um, and he seems to deal particularly with Irish emigration and the Irish diaspora, and has written extensively about this, has published many books. And um, to, from what I can gather here, he is a bit of an expert on this particular emigration that he's going to talk to us tonight about, which is uh, James Hack Tuke uh, and his assisted emigrants from the west of Ireland in the 1880s. Uh, a fascinating subject and um, maybe something that will give us all a basis for new research. So uh, without further ado, I want to welcome Jared very warmly to the society and um, after the, the talk, we'll have a, a short question and answer. Um, and uh, just make sure you don't have radios or mobile phones or anything like that on in the background when you're asking questions. So, Jared, you're very welcome to the Genealogical Society of Ireland. Where you go. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity to you know, talk to the society. Because I think, okay, there is a very important connection both between history and the genealogy uh, in, you know, you know, when we talk about immigration and you know, the, uh, especially those immigrants you know, who traveled uh, to North America in the 19th century. Um, I suppose it, it is significant in the sense that okay, we are commemorating the 175th anniversary of Black 47 which was the high point of the Great Hunger. Um, the, what has to be remembered is that, okay, the Great Hunger of 1845 to 52 was only you know, one of quite a number of famines, subsistence crisis, crop failures that occurred in the 19th century. In actual fact, it was you know, stated in 1902 that there were 29 of these crises that occurred between you know, uh, 1801 and you know, the early 20th century. And, but the one particular famine that seems to, you know, up until recently has been forgotten, neglected or ignored is what we call the forgotten famine of 1879 to 82. It is sometimes as well called the little famine. Now, the reason why it largely has been forgotten is because of the agrarian and political you know, um, agitations that were taking place at that particular time. But what has to be remembered is that in you know, the period after the Great Hunger, Ireland largely you know, uh, became you know, the, a type of you know, sort of dual economy. You had that part in the south and the east of the country where you had massive declines in population um, and on the, you know, along the western seaboard what you have is quite a large number of you know, the, uh, places in which the population actually but you know, the population along the western seaboard in some of the poor law unions was increasing here i've just given some examples in relation to the number of crises that you have um, in the 19th century, you know, the uh, ones like 1831 to 33, 1821 to 23, 1885 uh, to 6 you know, are reasonably well, well known. But as I said, okay, that of 1879 to 82 you know, is largely called the Forgotten Famine. 
the polar unions that I'm going to be talking about you know, tonight are along the western seaboard. You, know, you have you know, sort of Clifton, Uchtherard, which happened to be amalgamated by at this stage in with Galway. You have Newport, which had been amalgamated in 1885 for financial reasons with Westport, and Balmullet, which uh, you know, had been amalgamated you know, the, uh, originally in with the Polo Union in your know, sort of Balanam. But to get a sense of how the population was increasing in some of the poor law unions, you know, sort of you know, here. Um, okay, if, you, if we look at places like you know, Uchtherard between 1871 and 1881, the population actually increases by 6%. You know, um, in you know, the Balmullet, it by 4.5%. In Swinford, it is 1.5%. And there are a number of others that I haven't included here, like Dunfanaghy and Donegal, where the population goes up as well. Um, Clemoris is you know, um, another one where this actually happens. But if you bring it down to a parish level, you will see, you know, we see how dramatic the population increase is. Okay, for example, you know, on Ackle, the population increases by 16% between 1871 and 1881. Barishul, you know, which includes you know, the town of Newport, increases by 19%. And Bahola, which is in the Swinford Polo Union increases by a massive you know, 56%. The reason for this was there are areas in the country which retained pre-famine structures, you know, uh, pre-1845. Um, this facilitated practices such as the subdivision of holdings, early marriages resulting in farms becoming unviable. And you know, if you look at places like you know, sort of Mulrani, where in 1885, you still have the Rundale system. When James Hachuk visits you know, the uh, Mulrani in 1885, he speaks with one farmer whose you know, plots of land are in 30 different places. Early marriage, the subdivision of holdings and pressure on land and increased poverty, so that many families were existing at you know, a subsistence level. The extent of the poverty as a result of this congestion can be seen in a place like Karna in Connemara, where um, in 1881, it had a population of 5,270, comprising 9,560 uh, sort of families. But there were on the 781 farms, which indicates that mm. some of these you know, two families were actually sharing the one farm. In 1880, there was a report from the Bessborough Commission, which had inquired into the you know, landlord and uh, tenant relations. And the recommendation of the Bessborough Commission was that any farm that was under 15 acres was unviable. It was not able to support a family. But here we get some idea you know, the, of farm holdings and the size of farms you know, um, in 1881. But if we look there, you know, third, um, in Clifton, in Clifton, 69% of the farms were actually under 15 acres. And 16% you know, um, of them are under five acres. So absolutely minute. The, you know, um, in Balmullet, nearly three quarters of the farms are under 15 acres, with you know, one third of them under five acres. And in Newport, 68% of the farms are under 15 acres, uh, and with 39% under five acres. Between 1861 and 1881, when farms in the rest of the country were being consolidated into larger farms, what was actually happening in these areas that we're looking at here is that you know, um, farms were still being subdivided. When James Hachuk you know, um, was on his tour of the west of Ireland in the spring of 1880, he, um, he noted that these farms were unviable. And he said, it is important, it, uh, um, it is important to realize that farms 10, 15, or even 20 acres of land, according to its quality, are too small to support a family. It matters not whether a man has fixity of tenure or being a peasant proprietor, has no rent to pay. He cannot, unless he has some other source of income, live and bring a family up on the small farm under 10 or 15 acres of land. 
which form so large a proportion of the holdings in the west of Ireland. Okay, to put it in a context, if you look at, in places like Inishbofin, which had a population of 1,500, and any of you that have been to Inishbofin realise how poor the land is. It was stated that you know, the land you know, the, um, there was only you know, sort of good for people to go fishing on or to make kelp. When Chuk goes to Ackle Island, he comes across 200 families, or 250 families, who are trying to survive on 200 acres. If we come back to looking at what we were saying there in Bal you know, you know, Balmullet, the average size of holding in Balmullet was only three acres. And of these, one and a half acres was given to the production of potatoes because it remained the staple food for the population. In Karna, which I mentioned you know, sort of previously, one acre of land was giving over to the potato. Okay, this has been one of the points in relation to the 19th century and the importance of pot you know, potatoes. The, you know, an acre of potato was said to be able to support a family of six for a year. The equivalent would have been four acres of wheat to support the same family. The uneconomical nature of the holdings was not even you know, the, uh, something that James Hack commented on. Major Rutledge Fair, who became a very good friend of Chuk in the 1880s and the 1890s, you have stated, you know, uh, it is certain that the occupiers of such holdings never could nor ever did live on the produce of the land. So how did they? Rents were largely paid from the proceeds of non-agricultural activities, such as seasonal migration, the manufacture of kelp, or the remittances from relations who had left for North America. The importance of seasonal migration is really significant, especially to communities in Mayo, Donegal, and Roscommon. It was estimated by the 1870s, it was contributing about 250,000 pounds annually to the economy. On average, your seasonal migrant you know, and there is in the region of about you know, 12,000 of them that leave um, in the late 1870s, brought home 10 to 12 pounds from six weeks work in you know, uh, Shropshire, Lancashire, Lincolnshire and other parts of Britain. In particular, it was very significant on Ackle Island, you know, Swinford and Castlereagh. Okay, for, for example, in, on, in Castlereagh, it was estimated that about 60% of the population were directly dependent on the returns from seasonal migration. Um, they, but if you look at then throw in the shopkeepers, merchants, et cetera, who were, you know, were dependent on you know, sort of this money that was you know, uh, circulating in their economy from seasonal migration, you were talking about maybe 80 to 85% of the population of the Porto Union of Swinford where seasonal migration was so significant for them. The other major form of you know, um, income, non-agricultural income, was the manufacture of kelp. This was the burning of seaweed to make it into a fertilizer, you know, which was used on land. And in particular for coastal communities like those in Bonon or Renville, you know, they, the, um, for every ton that was you know, produced, you know, it meant that you know, the um, a farmer was getting about six to seven pounds when you know, sort of he sold it. While the population in many parts lived on a permanent knife edge, a combination of factors was responsible for the crisis that occurs in 1879. Firstly, you have a decline in seasonal migration remittances. You know, the, prior to 1879, in the early 1870s, it was estimated that about £250,000 was coming back through this particular process. But they, um, in 1879, 1880, this was down to about 100000 The reason for its decline was the increased use of mechanisation in British agriculture. This is the, you know, the time when the McCormick Reaper came in. And your McCormick Reaper could do the work, 
of one your know, third um, 100 laborers so you can see why there was a decline in the demand for season, uh, for seasonal workers as a result many of the seasonal migrants who go in 1879 1880 to England, their uh, families back in ireland have to you know, borrow money for them to be able to you know, uh, return home the other problem for coastal communities was the decline in the price of kelp the, you know, uh, the late 1870s saw the introduction of industrial you know, fertilizers from Germany and also the coming into being of Guyana from South America. So as a result, the pot farmers were getting for a ton of you know, kelp, the six to seven pounds, you know, by you know, 1879, 1880, they were only getting 30 shillings. Another factor was increased um, you know, American agricultural competition. This was the opening up of places like Minnesota, and I realize we have some friends here from Minnesota watching uh, this evening. But the um, opening up of the Midwest by the railways meant that agriculture produce could come to Europe much cheaper and be sold much cheaper than English or Irish uh, um, farmers could, you, uh, uh, could produce it. You also had, the um, in times of crisis, your tenant farmers in the West could always look to shopkeepers you know, for credit. And they, they more or less became you know, sort of the, the loan sharks. You know. On some occasions, you know, the, uh, the reputations were not very good. Okay, if, when you look at in places you know, like you know, Uchtarard, in Uchtarard, you know, the shopkeepers were owed you know, um, in 1879, 1880, 16,000 pounds. There was one shopkeeper in Castle Bar the you know, merchant who was owed eighteen thousand pounds, but you have a major banking collapse in eighteen seventy six, the Jay Cook Bank, which, as a result, you know, sort of credit, you know, the um, was very difficult to come by from banks, and it which affected shopkeepers as well. So shopkeepers were no longer giving loans or credit to farmers, and of course, the major thing was the failure of the potato. The severe weather of eighteen seventy eight to seventy nine resulted in very poor crop yields. The crop yield in 1879 was only one third of what it had been in 1876. The, you, um, the yield per acre for potatoes was 1.4 tonnes per acre, whereas for the you know, on average for the first half of the 1870s, it was about 3.4 tonnes per, you know, sort of per acre. In fact, the yield in 1879 was the lowest since Black 47. As early as the spring of 1879, there were reports of an impending famine, you know, and the Catholic clergy in particular did quite a lot in order to um, you know, make this you know, sort of public. One priest in July of 1879, Father Griffin, you know, the parish priest of Kilos, which is just outside Castle Bar, reported that there were 500 destitute families in his parish and as the year went on the situation even got worse despite appeals from the catholic hierarchy and your know, clergy throughout the country the government was not prepared to do anything in order to provide relief the reports of the famine you know they was occurring resulted in journalists making their way to the west of ireland one of the, you know, initially it was Irish journalists such as William O'Brien in the Freeman's Journal, but it followed by English journalists and American journalists like James Redpath. But in October 1879, William O'Brien went round you know, sort of Connemara. And in one of his reports from Oak the Rard, he stated, it is time for those who were responsible for the lives of the people to go stirring. The, uh, are they going to heed the cry from Connemara? until it comes from a coffin you know, sort of grave. And he issued about six of these reports in the Freeman's Journal you know, um, in October, early November, which were really you know, um, indicating the crisis that was there. By early 1880, one million people, about 40% of the population, the vast majority of them along the Western seaboard, were being kept alive by private relief. And the private relief organizations were the Mansion of House Relief Committee, which had been set up by Dwyer Gray, the uh, 
he was proprietor of the Freeman's Journal, but also Lord Mayor of Dublin at the time. And the money that they received was about 181,000. The Duchess of Marlborough Committee, which was set up ironically by the wife of the Irish Lord Lieutenant, you know, um, and the, you know, while it was in operation, they, they, um, it, get, it distributed 135,000 know, pounds. You have the Land League, you have the New York Herald Relief Fund, which was set up by the editor uh, Bennett of the, um, you know, the New York Herald, but also large amounts of money comes in to the Catholic Church, to you know, uh, the Archbishop of Toome, but also you know, to, um, Archbishop McCabe of you know, to, you know, Dublin. Without this money, you would have had a major crisis. Now, not only were they providing you know, money to the 640 you know, local relief committees that were established, but they also you know, sort of gave money for the purchase of seed potatoes because what people did was people almost you know, once their stock of potatoes you know, they had been diminished, they ate the seed potatoes. So there was nothing for planting for the following year. And the fear that the crisis, as it happened during the Great Hunger, would continue unless people had seed potatoes to plant. Um, and while this was success, nevertheless, there are parts of the country you know, in the West, parts of Donegal, parts of Mayo, parts of Connemara, where the famine continues right up until 1882. When the famine was at its height, the Society of Friends, or the Quakers, sent James Hackchuk to report on the crisis, to provide aid, and to work with the various relief organizations. He arrived in Ireland in February and proceeded immediately to the west of Ireland to investigate the extent of the famine. Now, he was the ideal choice because he had been sent in 1846 by the Quakers again to the west of Ireland. And in 1847, he had traveled around Donegal and the five counties you know, the, um, in Connacht, um, reporting on what he actually saw. Remember, at this stage, when he arrives, he's only 26 years of age. He, he revisited those areas that he had reported on in 1846 and 1847. And he quickly came to the conclusion that the condition of these people had not increased or improved to any great extent. What we actually see is his empathy with the people of the West, which had been evident in you know, 1847. But the, um, over his period, eight, the 1880s and 1890s, we can see Chuk's direct engagement in this period. During periods of famine and natural disasters. In 1882, when the government refused to send money to Karna, he took you know, 100 pounds off his, uh, out of his pocket and gave it to the parish priest of Karna to provide food for the people. Providing direct help for the poor over a long term period to improve their economic position, and this through his assisted immigration scheme. Indirect intervention to uh, better the lives of people through education and health provision, as was seen after 1891 with the Congested Districts Board, which he played such an important role in establishing and getting the politicians of the time, in particular Arthur Balfour, to become you know, uh, to push for the establishment of a Congested Districts Board. But the you know, um, his involvement in relief operations can be seen in four main you know, time periods. During the Great Famine of 1846 to 47, the Forgotten Famine of 1880, when, you know, when he spends 10 weeks in the country. In 1885 and 1886, when again you have a crisis with the, uh, with the crops in Mayo and in Connemara. And in 1889, when he travels throughout Donegal, when you have a crisis there. But his empathy can be seen you know, from a very early stage, and this is in 1847. You know, the, I feel uh, so incomplete to express or describe the state of the helplessness that those gentle suffering people are reduced to. Tenants of absentee landlords neglected by those who are living in luxury from the rents collected for the wretched people. Their patience is beyond belief. And this is you know, the first indication of his empathy with the people of the West of Ireland 
and his need to be able to help. During the 10 week tour of in 1880, Tuke ensured that he gathered information from as wide a range of sources as possible. Now, this was important on account of the fact at the time the British government was refusing to acknowledge that you had a major famine crisis in, um, in Ireland. They maintained that people were exaggerating. You know, the, um, some officials said, oh, the, um, it is like this the whole time in places like Mayo and Connemara and Donegal. What are they on about? But what Chuke actually did was you know, he spoke with the local clergy. He spoke with polo union officials. He spoke with shopkeepers. He spoke with the representatives of the local relief organizations. But not only that, he got them to bring them to villages and you know, sort of places which were so remote that many of the poor law union you know, sort of people in Dublin did not even know they existed or what the conditions were in these particular areas. In this way, he was able to forward reports you know, to England that were unbiased, that you know, they, um, were objective. And the thing was, he was listened to on account of the fact during the Franco-Prussian War of 1870, Tuke had went to Paris and reported in Paris you know, um, on conditions in Paris to an English public, you know, so who were prepared to believe everything that he said then. So it just made the point that if they were prepared to leave, believe everything in 1870, 1871, surely they would believe somebody, you know, the same person in 1880 in what he was seeing. On the trip to the west of Ireland, he engaged with local clergymen in particular. His reports were important because you know, the, he was witnessing at first hand what was happening. One feature that he observed was the failure of local landowners to provide relief for the tenants in a similar vein as during the Great Hunger. Now, part of the reason why landowners were not prepared to uh, provide relief was because of the agrarian agitation that was taking place. And where tenants were not paying their rent. But nevertheless, Tuke was prepared to condemn them. The manner in which what he actually saw was, can be seen in this report from Camus in Connemara in April of 1880, you know, um, in which he indicated, you know, I wish I could produce that rocky coast and wild, miserable village or rather introduce it into England for a while, so that English people might realize how in these uh, remote places, so many thousands of people are living. I would venture to say that no one would think it possible that human beings could leave, live or a, um, ever survive a, a foothold on these rock strewn shores. Several families were sick round small quantities of the smallest old potatoes I ever saw, and with nothing else to eat, but them. As he was about to leave Ireland in April 1880, he concluded that there was widespread distress. He was also you know, a bit taken aback that the agrarian agitation was to the forefront and the famine crisis with the potatoes you know, was very much you know, uh, secondary in you know, the minds of many your sort of political figures, etc. He concluded that there was widespread dis distress, but it was perennial and it would continue. That you know, this was not just a once-off famine; that there would always be crisis because of the size of holdings that people had, the dependency on the potatoes, and the unviable nature of the land that they had. He realised that unless radical changes were adopted, that this would continue. In fact, in July of 1880, you know, the, um, the, you know, when he was in America, he pointed out that it, the ideas in relation to emigration were put to him by clergymen, by you know, priests in places like Donegal. Here is one comment you know, sort of that you know, one of the priests, an unnamed priest, you know, the, uh, said to Tuke in 1880, let the people leave and in every way and um, in every way uh, that may take them out the sloth of poverty and misery in which they are you know, sort of present. Um, but 
as he left, he realized you know, that the fundamental changes needed to be made, both short term and long term. And it was around at this time that the issue of assisted immigration was being spoken about as a solution to the problem of overpopulation and congestion in the west of Ireland. Because in June of 1880, a scheme had taken place you know, the, um, under you know, sort of the James Nugent, a Liverpool priest who used to come to Connemara every summer. And when he heard about the famine crisis that was taking place, you know, the, you know, he established an assisted immigration scheme from Connemara um, the, you know, in June of 1880. 309 people, mainly families, were sent to Graceville, Minnesota, because he had been in contact with Bishop John Ireland, an Irishman originally from Kilkenny, who, um, who was the you know, sort of Bishop of St. Paul in Minnesota. And okay, these families were sent to Graceville you know, in Western Minnesota, given 160 acres of prairie land. You know, but unfortunately, the scheme was not a success because nearly all of the Connemaras had to be brought back to St. Paul. OK, they had been sent out to an area in which the agriculture practices was completely different to what the agriculture practices that they had been involved in, in places like you know, sort of Karna and Ahagaur in Mayo, which some of the families you know, sort of came from. Um, so that it had not been a success. But you know, sort of Chuk was aware of this. And in actual fact, Chuk held meetings with Nugent you know, and with John Sweetman, another individual, who well had an assisted immigration scheme going. So during the summer of 1880, Chuk spent his time in Canada and the Midwest, going around to see where there were opportunities that if people were sent to you know, uh, from Ireland, and what was the best way of sending them, you know, they, where the employment opportunities were best available. In 1882, Chuk put his ideas forward in an article that was published in the 19th century, the, uh, the uh, um, contemporary magazine at the time. And under his proposals for assisted immigration, only families would be you know, um, assisted. The reason why families would be assisted was on account of the fact it would leave their holdings then to be redistributed to the families who remained. At least one family member had to be able to speak English, because in places like um, Connemara and you know, Ackel, you know, the you know, Irish was the main language. Now, the reason why he was suggesting that, you know, that at least one family member you know, sort of had to have English uh, on account of the fact that they would be able to communicate with the local population and you know, etc. The family had to include a ratio of breadwinners to you know, dependents. So that um, there had to be a certain number of children over the age of 12, you know, they, um, compared to the number of children you know, under the age of 12. Immigrants should contribute towards the you know, travel fair and their transport. Now, he realized very quickly when he put the scheme into place that these people didn't have money and were unable to travel. But as a result of you know, the, um, these proposals that he was putting forward, it resulted in a committee, a meeting being held on the 31st of March, 1882, in the London home of the Duke of Bedford, in which about 100 you know, politicians and business leaders were invited to come. Chuk spoke about his emigration proposals to them, and a subscription was raised on the night, which resulted in £8,000 being collected. Chuk was asked to tra you know, travel to the west of Ireland and to put his scheme in place. Now, this meeting took place on the 31st of, um, 31st of March. On the 4th of April, Chuk was in Clifton. Why was he in Clifton? Well, the local guardians the previous February 
had agreed that they would take out a loan to help in relation to the you know, emigration of poor you know, sort of families from the area. So Chuk you know, felt that he could work in conjunction with them. One of the things he realized very you know, early on, it was important to work with your, lo your the local dignitaries. These are people like the local clergy, people like the local relieving officers, because these would, these would know who the most you know, the destitute people were who should be helped to you know, sort of, you know, leave. The reaction of the local clergy was mixed. There were you know, sort of priests in places like Karna, <clears throat> um, Rosmuk, who were totally in favour of it and actually you know, um, helped in the interview process. There were ones who would not give an opinion, largely waiting for to see how their parishioners would react. And there were those who were totally opposed. Now, the ones who were totally opposed were opposed. Firstly, they were afraid if these families were to leave, that the financial contributions that they made to their church you know, to, um, or to their parish would disappear. They were also worried about the religious morals of these uh, individuals you know, when they went to the States. The, he spoke about the poverty you know, the, um, at the meeting and, you know, the, um, in London, in which he said, the poverty is unspeakable, and what misery and suffering are born which can never be revealed until some stranger comes poking in those out of the way places. I mentioned before about his empathy and sympathy that he had with the you know, sort of people. This was to be seen again in July of 1882, just after the first you know, group of immigrants you know, um, had left you know, from the Clifton Poor Law Union. He was asked by an MP, why was he helping these Irish paupers to leave? And his response was, I would hardly like to use the word paupers because these people are the rank and file of the poorer classes of the district. So it just shows okay, the, uh, the, what he actually felt for these people he was helping to leave. On his arrival in Clifton, within a few hours, one of the priests approached him and said that he knew of 15 families who would be happy to immigrate almost immediately. By the end of the week, there were over 300 people who had expressed an interest to go. One of the big problems that he suffered before the end of April, the decision by the Clifton Board of Guardians to rescind the loan application for immigration, which meant that Chuk had to apply all of the funding from the Chuk committee you know, uh, to the Clifton area. He had realized in Balmollet and Newport, people had expressed an interest of being assisted to you know, uh, being helped to immigrate. But he was not in a position to be able to help this. But working with the local groups, the clergy, the relieving officers, your know, doctors as well. What is amazing is that within three weeks of him arriving in Clifton, the first of the immigrants left. This is an illustration by the famous illustrator Alfred O'Kelly of the immigrants you know, third, congregating in Clifton before they were sent to Galway on their way to uh, the United States. But you know, the, here we see the first group leave on the 28th of April on the Austrian. You know, three weeks you know, the, after you know, sort of had started in, you know, um, in you know, sort of Clifton. But you know, the, by the 19th of May, you're talking about six to seven weeks later, he had sent out 1,267 you know, sort of people, 222 families. Here are some of them, the ones who left of the Nepigan, you know, the, uh, the second boat. Who, and if you look, what you actually see is you know, the, many of, the, you know, of these, the adults, are not typical immigrants. The Irish immigrant in the 19th century 
tended to be in the 16 to 24 age cohort. But if you look there, okay, the Patrick Murray down there who's 60, you have the you um you look at John King, you have the who's you have 50 um 55, Matt Mullen who is 60. But we also you sort of get an indication of who the children and their ages you have to, you actually are. But this just gives it's a sample of the group that leave on the first one. But at the end of May, your 1882, Tuke came to the conclusion that the a scheme such as this was not you know, the, um, that a private relief organisation or a private charity was not in a position to be able to send out those who wanted to leave. He approached the British government of W.E. Gladstone. Now, he was fortunate at the time. His best friend was W.E. Foster, and W.E. Foster was the chief secretary for Ireland. So using his business and political contacts, he was eventually able to get um, W.E. Gladstone to agree to provide £100,000 for assisted emigration in 1883. The two committee was to administer the scheme in Clifton, but now in Newport, Balmollet, and Uthurard. The Polo Guardians were to administer the scheme in another 37 Polo units. What he found when he came to, you know, in 1880, started his interview process in 1883, the demand was just phenomenal. When he arrived in uh, Karna on the 23rd of February, there were three to 400 people waiting to be interviewed, to be sent on the scheme. What we actually see is the amount of time and effort he puts in to you know, the scheme. He based himself in letter frac, you know, the, uh, which had a connection with the um, Society of Friends, with the Quakers. But he travelled throughout, you know, th uh, you know, um, up to Linan, you know, sort of down to you know, sort of places like Recess, you know, Roundstone, and all of this was done, you know, sort of the um, by horse and cart. Now he was accompanied by his wife Georgina. Georgina was his second wife, who he had married the previous November. So here she was, you know, sort of three months later, arriving in Connemara, being involved in the scheme. The schemes was being administered by you know, sort of the um, colleagues of Chuk in um, places like you know, in Balmollet and in Uthara. But we get some sense of the amount of time that they were being put, putting in. They had to interview them. Then they had the whole the, uh, process of providing them with clothing to leave. You know, the, um, the bureaucracy that was involved, there was something like 10 to 12 forms that had to be signed for each particular family. Georgina, in her diary, indicates that they would get up you know, sort of at sunrise, they would have breakfast, they would leave you know, sort of, um, for some place you know, the, um, you know, in North Connemara or South Connemara. And that you know, interview people for maybe four to five hours, travel back, have something to eat, and then work until midnight doing the administrative function that was involved. This is what Georgina said you know, the, on the 22nd of February. This selecting is, you know, third, you know, you know, sorry, I've left it, you know, third, it's painful. And we have so many applications uh, you know, uh, that could be granted for the steamer on the 23rd, this was on the 23rd of March. We can also see your sort of Chuk's your response during this period. He said, the poor things, you know, it is worth the, you know, the, the trouble uh, to, de you know, to deliver them you know, sort of from our hard walls. So the, you can see the amount of time and effort that was going in, and this continued right up until June. The destinations that they were sent to in 1883, there's a total of over 5,300 you know, sort of who leave. The, fifth, you know, um, the 
largest group comes from Balmullet and you know, sort of Newport, um, 2,500 of them. From Clifton, there's about 1,500, and from your know, sort of Uchtarard, there's over 1,200. What Chuke wanted, he tried to persuade them to go to Canada. Part of the reason why Canada was the option was the Canadian government promised to meet the immigrants when they arrived in Quebec and distribute them out to you know, the uh, to Ontario, Manitoba, which was then being opened up, and some of them to Quebec. But there was a problem in that the vast majority of the immigrants did not want to go to Canada. They wanted you know, to go to friends and relations in the United States. There's a very good story that's told from the selection process in Inish Beagle by Sidney Buxton. <clears throat> and they, he interviewed you know, the, um, this individual and the individual, you know, he asked the individual where he wanted to go. And the individual said, you know, America. And the individual, you know, the, the Buxton said to him, do you have friends or relations there? And he said, no. So, well, I can't send you to you know, uh, Amer America, but I can send you to Canada. Uh, I, I don't want to go there, but it's the only place I can send you. And he said, OK, I'll go there, provided you don't, you know, you don't send a wife with me. So you, know, you get some of these stories that are told along the way. But in the first group that was sent out in 1882, you know, only one family you know, they went to Canada. The second group, 10 families you know, went. And but you have to, you know, over time, your know, sort of numbers did start to increase, as you see there from the numbers that go from um, Balmullet and Newport. Just an interesting sideshow you know, to this. I remember giving a talk a few years back to the Antiquarian Society of Ireland. And the, the, uh, one of the people in the audience you know, was a retired bank official. And he would you know, told me afterwards that his first posting was in Balmullet. But the foreign currency that he was dealing with was not US dollars, but Canadian dollars, you know, uh, an indication that these were you know, people where the money was being you know, sort of, uh, sent back from some of these you know, sort of immigrants. The other scheme you know, sort of by the poor law unions, this just gives you some idea, the, uh, the other unions sent out 2,241, and this is just you know, the some of the, the places, the numbers that they came from. But once again, at the end of 1883, Chuke decided that he, you know, he was going to ask the government for more money. And £50,000 was made available. But in addition to the four poor law unions, they were asked to look after the uh, Swinford and also Aranmore Island of Donegal. But as you can see there, the numbers were not as great in 1884, uh, 2,802. And part of the reason for this was there was a very good harvest, you know, potato harvest in 1884. So people were not as you know, they, uh, receptive to the idea of you know, sort of you know, immigrating. Where did these immigrants go to? We know of 219 destinations that were sent to. Okay, the, um, you, have, you have Portland, Maine, but that, you have, when you look down you have Massachusetts, there are 19 you have, sort of destinations. There are eight you have, sort of in Vermont and in Rhode, you have, Rhode Island. But the other main places were Pennsylvania and Minnesota. Now, the reason why Minnesota became so important was Bishop John Ireland eventually agreed to take the, the, these immigrants that were being you know, sort of sent out. And you can see some of the places that they actually went to, some of them to Graceful, you know, um, some of you know, places like St. Paul um, and you know, sort of so, you know, uh, so on. Now, part of the reason why the, many of them go to Minnesota is on account of the fact that Bishop Ireland, John Ireland, decides that he will send two families to each, to each part, you know, to a certain number of parishes, and that you know, the parish priest in these particular areas will look at, you know, um, will look after these two families. Now, this was something that eventually you know, sort of took, um, put into place in you know, the some of the other places that they were sent to. For example, 
two families are sent to Peterborough in Ontario. And what is interesting there is the most of the Irish that were in Peterborough, Ontario, had been sent out under the Peter Robinson scheme between 1823 and 1825, and these were descendants. These were you know, uh, descendants built the houses for these two families, got jobs for them, you know, employed them, looked after them. You have a similar situation in Richmond in you know, the um, um, in Indiana, where a father McWalter takes in two families, you know, sort of the, the from Balmullet, and you know, the similar you know, situation. But some of the ones who go to New England here, to uh, North you know, uh, Rosnerdale, they went to, uh, to a mill where the Mr. Briggs, the you know, owner of the mill, had said he would take a number of families. You also find a similar situation in Warren, you know, sort of Rhode Island. Who were these people? We know a certain amount about them, and I'll give you your know, sort of further details later on. These are the ship manifests. You know, and if you look there, you're know, sort of Patrick Sullivan. And Patrick Sullivan was from you're know, sort of from uh, Van Mullet. You know, the, but he was going to Holyoke in Massachusetts. Why? Because his wife had three you know, the, um, sisters living there who were prepared to look after him. You got know, the family when they went there. Okay, he goes with his three you know, sort of children who you know, range in age from 11 down to six. Also, there is Patrick Laval, a laborer aged 45, and he was going to Askland in Massachusetts. And with you know, the, um, his children, okay, they, they're all not included there, but I think it is seven that are there. But what you actually find is that many of the immigrants look to be sent to friends and relations in, play, in uh, places like Cleveland, in places you know, uh, like Scranton in Pennsylvania, and you know, uh, parts of Massachusetts. Those who leave from you know, the Inish Key Islands, virtually all of them end up in Holyoke you know, um, in Massachusetts. Now, you can understand maybe why many of these wanted to go to friends and relations. The friends and relations would provide them with employment opportunities, you know, with shelter, but also the fact that many of these were Irish speakers and you know, they wanted to be able to go to you know, communities in which Irish was spoken. One of the things, one of the aims that Chuk had was that money, remittances, would be sent back which would, you know, uh, first of all, encourage others to emigrate, but also could be used by these families back home in order to, you know, uh, to pay rent, etc. Here we have a case of one, you know, one girl who was sent out. And in 1883, she sends you know, 30 pounds um, back to her parents. Also, a passage fare for her sister, which cost seven pounds. <clears throat> In total, she sends back thirty-nine pounds. She is employed as a waitress in a restaurant in Chicago, and has a place for her sister with her. The girl is eighteen years old, uh, is earning you know, sort of five dollars a week plus one pound a week you know, for food and you know, uh, and the, for, you know, for lodgings. The younger sister, who's sixteen, and will be able to earn three dollars a week. We get quite a number of letters that you published you know, from these immigrants that left. I think there are a total of something uh, uh, like 60 letters that are published you know, sort of, uh, from former immigrants telling how they're getting on. Sorry, I want, don't want to see that one yet. But you, know, they, you have an individual from you know, sort of, um, Finnish in Connemara, who's in you know, Portland in Maine, and he says, you know, he writes back you know, to a relation. If you were to give me all of Finnish you know, um, Island for nothing, I would not go back there. I can earn more here than I can you know, the, um, for a lifetime in you know, sort of Finnish. Another individual you know, who's you know, in Portland I, you know, uh, pointed out he wished he had left four years earlier because he would be a rich man now. 
the money that is sent back, Chuk estimates in 1884 that about 4,000 had been sent back at that stage. 2,500 had arrived back in Clifton. The money comes back you know, th between two pounds you know, th and six pounds, seven pounds. Um, in some cases, you know, it is higher. Some of the landlords actually tell Chuk in 1889 that the money that is sent back you know, is the equivalent of the rent that their, you know, the, their parents you know, are actually paying. So you, you, you see the advantage that it has there. But how do people react and how do Americans react? Well, the, um, the Boston Globe in 1883, when one of the groups you know, is very complimentary of how the people are, you know, the, uh, how the, well they're dressed, you know, they, they look well, and you know, they, it's an indication that they are you know, um, going to do reasonably well. But there were others. And the, you know, this is an indication of one for, on the Nestorian, you know, the, um, from you know, the, a Canadian, you know, the, um, a Canadian you know, illustrative journal, and you're know, indicating that these are paupers coming from you know, Ireland, resonating the idea of the coffin ship, which you know, in the 1847, 1848, everybody knew. But that is the ship as they portray it. But this was the actual ship on the right hand side, you know, the, the Nestorian, a very modern ship. Because what Chuk actually did was he got you know, the um, the shipping line to come in to you know, the, um, into and also into um, into Galway to collect these. And here's another indication from you know, the satirical magazine, and you can see the Irish pauper, the Chuk immigrant, uh, not being wanted by. You know, England on one side and you know, the Americans on the other. Why did the schemes come to an end? And I'm conscious that we're, your time is with us. The Canadian decision to no longer accept Irish immigrants, largely because of immigrants that had been sent out by the poor law unions that were left destitute in Toronto. And in March 18, um, 1884, they decided they would no longer accept any immigrants, even though they did acknowledge two immigrants you know, that we, uh, came very well prepared and very looked after, well looked after. The opposition of the Catholic bishops in the West of Ireland and the clergy, in particular John McEvely, on account of the this fear with that went round that the morals you know, um, of the immigrants you know, they would be uh, affected you know, by going to rural America. The hostility of Parnell and the Irish Parliamentary Party. What is interesting is, in 1882, when the scheme was uh, you know, first taken place, Parnell asked in the House of Commons, you know, who is this guy, Mr. Chuk? You know, he hadn't heard of him you know, they, um, until he was informed by one of the Liberal MPs that he was a philanthropist. The refusal of the Polo Guardians, which were now under the control of the Irish Parliamentary Party, you know, to allow their employees to work with the schemes. There was also a threat by American authorities to repatriate immigrants back. Again, these were the poor law immigrants that had been sent out and the good harvest of 1884. What do we know about these? And you know, they, um, these are some of the ones who left and I won't go through them because you know, sort of the time you know, sort of issue that we have. But you can see you know, sort of who they were the, you know, the children that uh, were with them, you know, the problems you know, sort of that um, they had the destination to Warren, Rhode Island, there you know, with the Phillips you know, sort of family, then moving you know, sort of around, going to Clinton you know, sort of in Massachusetts, you know, and what happened to some of the families. Now, there's a certain problem which you know, uh, you gen genealogists probably come across. The, an Irish name and okay on the american side you can't find it a very good example of this is a guy by the name of john toher t-o-u-g-h-e-r I, I think he's the next one yeah john toher but the uh what happens is the name becomes tucker so you can imagine when you know, sort of, somebody with a west of ireland brogue being asked you know, sort of his name by an official and putting the name down you know, 
Um, he goes, you know, Tucker. And the official thinks, oh, this is Tucker. You know, um, so, and the name changes. And it, as a result, it has continued. They've had to, the families have had to continue with this. But this is an example of a fam you know, the family who go to um, Connecticut. You know, the, and eventually you know, sort of move, move around. You know, the, um, ending up in New Jersey. And then you know, sort of back you know, the, you know, um, the, you know, again. Another one you know, are the, you know, it's the Gallagher family who, uh, and from Ackle. Now, quite a number of the ones from Ackle end up in Cleveland, Ohio. There is one guy, Michael McNamara, when he's writing back and he says to his parents, don't worry about me. I know more people here in Cleveland from home than I do back in Ackle. So it just shows okay, why people actually wanted to go to particular you know, sort of areas, like the ones from Kosharaga in Connemara. They wanted to go to Portland in Maine because there was a uh, Kosharaga community there. The ones from the Inishkees that I mentioned before who wanted to go to Holyoke. But here's a family you know, the, you know, um, that end up you know, sort of in Cleveland they, with other you know, sort of families. But, and I'm going to leave this up. Here are websites that you should take a look at, at if you're interested in this. In particular, the first one there, Black Sod Bay Immigration. Rosemary Garrity has done fantastic work on the website. The, of the 450 families that you know, left you know, the Balmullet and Newport, she has been able to make contact with the descendants of about half of them. The other one, which is really worth taking a look at as well, you know, there is you know, Uqdarard Her you know, sort of Heritage. And again, you know, the couple of very good in Geraldine Mills, you know, the, you know, there, and uh, the Antoinette Leiden. Clifton Heritage is another very go good you know, sort of site for looking at. Um, the Galway Community Heritage Group because the heritage officer has just been absolutely fantastic in the work that she's done here um, for you know, the, you know, the Chuuk immigrant immig immigration scheme. And the other one then is the Karna Immigration Centre for ones that left from the Karna you know, sort of area. Uh, but before you know, sort of I finish, there are two of the descendants I know who are with us you know, you know, today who are in Minnesota and have been doing Trojan work in relation to getting the Chuuk story told in Minnesota, because once again, Chuuk has largely been forgotten about, you know, they, you know, um, even across the water. Okay, three weeks ago, I was in Boston doing a talk on Chuuk, and the, at the end, two you know, the, um, people came up to me who were you know, descendants. They knew that their connections you know, was with Balmullet. And they had come over, you know, the family had come over in the 1880s, but they did not know how. But this is why the Chuuk story is so important that it's made public and people know. And with that, I'll you know, sort of stop. Jared, thank you so much.